My name is Julian Cox, Curator of Photography here at The High, and um, delighted to pre present tonight's event, which is organized in conjunction with our current exhibition, Harry Callahan, Eleanor, which is uh, located in the lower level of our Whelan Pavilion across the piazza here. If you haven't seen the exhibition already, I encourage you to do so. It's uh, on view until December the 9th. The subject of the exhibition, Eleanor herself, is here in the third row of the auditorium, and we're delighted to have her company this evening. Thank you for being here, Eleanor. Our two presenters, Chip Simone and John McWilliams, are here because they were students of, of Harry Callahan's in the 1960s at the Rhode Island School of Design and have important stories to tell about their time with Harry and also uh, talking about the ways in which their creative careers have flowered since then. So it's really, uh, in a sense, a double program, hearing about Harry Callahan and Eleanor during those years back in the 1960s when both these artists were beginning to find their way in the world as creative individuals, but also learning um, more information, more insight, if you will, into Harry Callahan and into Eleanor as well. So we hope, uh, we look forward to the, the, the sharings that these two artists will provide for us this evening. Uh, first of all, Chip Simone will speak for about 20 minutes or so, then John McWilliams will speak, and then I'll moderate an informal Q&A afterwards for about 15 minutes. So our first speaker this evening, Chip Simone, was a student of Harry Callahan's at RISD from uh, 1964 to 1967. And uh, he describes that experience as being you know, fundamental, instrumental to his career uh, since. Uh, when he graduated there, he went on to teach at the University of South Dakota from 1967 to 1971. And then he moved to Atlanta in 1972. And he's been a very, very important part of the photographic community here in Atlanta since then. Uh, in, in, in many ways, this event is a sort of celebration of the riches that are under our own feet, and, and uh, Chip is, is part of that, of that richness. Uh, for example, he was a founding member of the Nexus Gallery, Atlanta's very first gallery dedicated to photography, uh, which opened in 1972-1973. And since then, he's been a, an important player in all sorts of different photographic initiatives in the, in the city of Atlanta. In terms of his own creative work, his work is represented in major museums across the country, such as the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the High Museum of Art, and the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, D.C. And tonight he'll talk about some of his uh, different projects through the years. Uh, for example, in 1996, he published a book called On Common Ground, Photographs from the Crossroads of the New South, which is uh, a really rich uh, pictorial presentation of the city of Atlanta in, in, in the year that uh, marks the Olympics, of course, 1996. Um, more recently, as recently as 2006, uh, he conceived, managed, and participated in a project called Artists Photographing Artists, which was organized under the auspices of, of MOCA GA just down the street, but really uh, Chip was a, a guiding force in that project. Uh, and as I say, just one example of the many ways in which he's enriched our photographic community. Please join me in welcoming Chip Simone. Good evening. Good evening. You hear me okay? Eleanor, can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, it's, re it's really a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'd like you to go right ahead and, and bring the lights down, if you will, uh, to the person out there that does that. Anyone who knows me also knows how much Harry Callahan means to me. Uh, and I want to thank the High Museum of Art, and especially Julian, uh, Julian has been very generous to the photography community with his time, his enthusiasm, and his goodwill. Uh, he's really made a difference uh, here in Atlanta. Uh, so I want to thank you for organizing this evening's program, and thank you for asking me to be a part of it. Uh, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge with gratitude the enormous contribution that my friend John McWilliams made to creative photography in Atlanta. John is the godfather of Atlanta's photography community. 
As a teacher at Georgia State, John encouraged and supported many aspiring photographers. And as an exceptional artist, John's passionate commitment to his vision has been an inspiration to us all. I'm very proud to be his friend. And I would like to express my respect and affection to Eleanor Callahan and her family. I'm grateful to them for a friendship that has spanned more than 40 years now. It's been both a privilege and a delight to know you, and I'm thrilled that you're here with us tonight, Eleanor. Julian asked us to discuss our work and our relationship with Harry Callahan starting four decades ago and how we got here from there. In order to get here from there, I'll be moving back and forth in time with both words and pictures. I'd like to preface my talk this evening with a brief note about joy. At the heart of my remarks is a simple joyous act the act of seeing passionately. It's what Harry did. It's what John does. And no matter how we describe it with words, it's what we mean when we say photography. The American poet John Chiardi wrote, a man is what he does with his attention. Photography is what I've done with mine. I didn't become a photographer because of Harry Callahan. I knew long before I met him that I wanted to be a photographer. Back in the 1950s, I discovered the camera that my parents took on their honeymoon to the 1938 New York World's Fair. It's a Kodak Bantam, vintage 1937. The camera no longer worked, but it had a two-piece pop-up viewfinder. And that's what got me started in photography, the viewfinder of a broken camera. As a boy, I carried the camera around with me and looked at everything through it. I was mesmerized. I realized early on that cameras saw things in a different way, and the viewfinder was what I needed to see them. Fifty years ago, I looked through the viewfinder, and I've never looked back. That's when, I, that's when I decided I was a photographer, when I was a young boy and I started seeing pictures long before I ever actually made one. To this date, my photographs pay homage to that viewfinder, the one that fit in my pocket and transformed the commonplace into something wondrous. I grew up in an Italian-American community known as Shrewsbury Street, a working, class a working class neighborhood of three-decker tenements uh, in Worcester, Massachusetts. I mention this because Shrewsbury Street profoundly influenced how I see and what I photograph. Surviving on the street called for sharp reflexes and a quick wit, which was excellent preparation for becoming a photographer. Shrewsbury Street was filled with eccentric, Runyon-esque characters that talked with their hands and their fists. Laborers and bookies, wise guys and butchers, with names like Teddy Rags 
and Nikki Shosho. Men wore fedora hats and top coats and hung out in front of all night diners. Women cussed like men. Uh, they waited tables or did piecework in necktie factories. They wore seamed nylons, cheap perfume, and furs that were sometimes stolen. It was a vulgar and textured place full of broken language and rough edges. These were the people who I saw on the street every day, the ones who taught me how to laugh out loud and to see with all my heart, and I still celebrate them in my pictures. By junior high school, I carried a 35 millimeter camera with me everywhere, even into the classrooms. Oh, sorry, I've gotten a little ahead of myself here. Go back, actually. Yeah. Okay. By junior high school, I carried a small camera with me everywhere, including into my junior high school classrooms. That fellow is named Bernie Qualieri. He was putting the moves on some girl. Uh, and I used to shoot by available light, uh, and I pretended I was Alfred Eisenstadt on Assignment for Life magazine. I used to dream about Leica M3s. In high school, I apprenticed with a commercial photographer. I carried his equipment at weddings and social events, watched from the edges while he posed young women, draping them in black velvet for formal portraits. He used a 5 by 7 split-back camera with a packard shutter and a pneumatic air release. I watched while he retouched their pimples from the negatives with graphite lead. I sat on his windowsill and made red sunproofs of the portraits on printing out paper by holding a contact frame in bright sunlight then slid the unfixed proofs into the black envelope that was given to the client. Each time the client looked at the proofs, the image faded a little bit more. He let me use his Super D Graflex, similar to the one that Stieglitz used. I suspect that most of you have no idea what I'm talking about. And then I went to the Rhode Island School of Design. I was the first for my family and one of the first for my, my neighborhood to go to college. Suffice it to say, I was fortunate that RISD didn't pay too close attention to my grades or my college boards. Uh, the school used its own entrance exam to choose the 253 f freshmen. RISD was a small, highly select community of talented individuals, some truly gifted. It was remarkable preparation for a life as a visual artist. It placed you in the world and also in a world apart. The program integrated perception, visualization, craftsmanship, conceptual invention, critical thinking, and placed it in an art historical context. What is the architecture of a picture? How does one visualize an idea or a feeling? Pretty heady stuff for an 18-year-old. We developed a sophisticated relationship to the creative process in a sense that we were becoming part of the historic family of artists. Being a RISD student wasn't easy, but it was simply the best thing that ever happened to me. When I was 19, I met Harry Callahan. From that day, the course of my life changed direction. The less you try to understand Harry Callahan, the easier it is to do. Harry loved photography, how it worked, what it did, and most of all, how it enabled him to see the world. It's all there in his pictures. Harry has been quoted as saying, there are some guys who don't think I understand what I've done. The odd thing is, I've done it. Well, Harry didn't think he could teach. 
The odd thing is, he could, and he did it in spades. In a 1983 interview for the exhibition, Harry Callahan and His Students, A Study in Influence, I said that Harry Callahan didn't teach basic photography, he taught basic photographer. You see, Harry didn't teach us what to do, he taught us what to be. The distinction is even clearer to me now. I understand its meaning in a more profound way, with insight that can only come with the passage of time. The German poet Rainer Rilke advised young poets to draw from their everyday lives in order to locate some sort of beauty. I learned from Harry to see inside of my daily life a private beauty of my own making. Being a Callahan student was not a common experience. First, because there weren't that many of us. And second, because how and what he taught was uncommon. Harry was a teacher who didn't like teaching and didn't think he was good at it. He didn't talk about nuts and bolts very much. He didn't talk about aesthetics or philosophy or photo history. In fact, he didn't like to talk much at all, except to say he loved photography, which was the only thing he didn't need to say that part we got. Unlike Minor White, who co-created the zone system with Ansel Adams, Harry didn't place much emphasis on complex methods and techniques. Basic techniques were sufficient to do expressive work. I remember asking Harry about Minor White's zen-like teaching. He paused and then said awkwardly, you shouldn't try to turn photography into religion. Harry seemed to know that the most important things couldn't be taught but they could be learned. By his example, we saw that photography was a meaningful way of life, that there is nobility and dignity in that life, in the search for images and in the struggle for personal vision. Harry never promised riches or fame or happiness, just good days and bad. The payoff came from doing the work, knowing that each picture informed the next. That was enough to make a meaningful life. That's what photographers did. It was a poet's journey without the words. The photography world of the mid-1960s was very different than today's. Claiming that photography was an art form invited ridicule even from the arts community. Minor White was up at MIT, Walker Evans was at Yale, Henry Holmes Smith was at Indiana, Aaron Siskin was in Chicago, and Ansel Adams was preaching from some mountaintop out on the West Coast. There were about 400 photography students in the country. There weren't many photography majors at RISD. Uh, but it was a small and, and potent group that included John, Linda Connor, Bill Burke, Jim Dow, and Emmett Gowan. I mean, people that have gone on to distinguish themselves, as many of you well know. It was an amazing time. We were all starting to develop our own way of seeing. Photography was beginning to step out of the shadows. Beaumont Newhall's History of Photography was the only book available on the subject. The last photograph in his book was one of Harry Callahan's. Risley was the fertile soil. We were the seeds, Harry was the rain. I really didn't learn photography from Harry certainly not in the conventional sense, none of us did. Harry created a unique Bauhaus approach to teaching basic photography that allowed us to learn it from ourselves. We did exercises that reveal the basic nature of the materials and equipment. Louis Armstrong once said that he didn't need to learn to play the trumpet. He had to teach the trumpet to say what he wanted it to. Harry taught photography in much the same way. He was insistent that above everything else, the purpose of a life in photography was to develop your own approach. He paid close attention to what we did, and he used his awkward language codes to guide us along the path that we had chosen. We paid attention to the pictures that he said were nifty. That was a very important word. And we stayed away from the ones that were not so hot. We weren't asked to decode them, deconstruct them, analyze them, or think about them in a political context. 
He asked us to look at them and then look again, and we became students of ourselves. If Harry said we made a good picture, we went back into it to try to understand what was good about it in order to develop our intuitive senses. The answers were always in the pictures, and so were the questions, and they still are. This is not to imply that there were no technical standards. There were, and there were, they were very high, but never clinical. The quality of the picture was not independent of the intent of the image. Photography is a singular consideration. It's about making pictures, and pictures speak in their own tongue. We learn that each of us has to look in order to see passionately, that the camera can distill the world in front of us into the world inside of us. Harry encouraged us to follow our instincts and our hearts in order to discover our own way of seeing. He insisted on it. In a way, Harry didn't teach photography. He taught the poetics of seeing. I began to realize that I had my own way and that photography gave it both form and meaning. I didn't become a photographer because of Harry Callahan, but I became the photographer that I am because of him. In 1972, Kathy and I moved to Atlanta. By 73, impressed by John's contact prints, I started working with the 8x10 camera. The big camera was a very physical and deliberate way of working, emotionally consistent with the laid-back atmosphere of, of Atlanta back then. The big camera enabled me to concentrate on mastercraft and expressive printing in a way that I had never done. The descriptive power of the contact print was amazing. I started with gold chloride prints, a very 19th century process, and eventually switched to azo paper and a variation of Edward Weston and Walker Evans Amidol water bath developers. It was like easel painting in the sense um, it was like easel painting in the sense that every picture was carefully considered and crafted. I stayed close to home, made nudes, still lives, and portraits, the kind of pictures that were traditional view camera pictures. But true to my nature, I eventually took it out to the streets. I exploited the wooden camera's physical presence and warm personality. It attracted people like a magnetic tool, and I worked with it exclusively for 10 years. Atlanta was a wonderful place back then. There were many dedicated and enthusiastic photographers in a growing arts community. Even A.D. Coleman, Michael, you know that the artist. Even A.D. Coleman, photo writer for the Village Voice, used to come and hang out with us. Something was happening in Atlanta. In 1973, 13 of us started Nexus, the city's first photography gallery. Nexus was primarily a response to censorship. It was the 70s, after all, and some of us were exploring themes that galleries wouldn't exhibit, so we opened, <coughs> opened our own gallery where we could show anything as long as it had artistic integrity.
1983, supported by a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, I began working in color for the first time. I chose to work with Kodachrome film because it was unforgiving. It was the opposite of the 8x10. There was no, contr no control after the fact. More importantly, it got me out of the dark room and away from the rituals that had begun to hobble my spontaneity. Working with the hand camera refreshed my love for the spontaneous moment and the unexpected epiphany. As much as I loved the discipline of the stationary camera, working the streets made my heart beat faster. I integrated the lessons of the 8x10, applied, it, applied them to seeing in color, and took my show on the road. About four years later, and probably for the final time, I went back to black and white. I had become interested in the dynamics of the contemporary urban South, a topic which is still under-examined. Things in the South had really changed. It seems Scarlett O'Hara was now wearing a tattoo and sporting a pierced nipple. In 2000, I went kicking and screaming into the digital realm. After 35 years in the dark room, the romance had gone from the rituals of wet process. Something was happening to me. Photography was still about seeing passionately, but I was seeing pictures faster than the dark room could keep up with. I was no longer interested in the pace or limitations of the 20th century, let alone the 19th. Once I got inside the digital process, all of the guilt and inhibitions of straight photography be began to evaporate. The strict rules of straight photography that I had followed religiously went out the window, and I wallowed in my sinfulness. But in the final analysis, it's still photography. It still takes a viewfinder. It's still about making pictures. This is a very exciting time to be a photographer. It's time for risk-taking, experimentation, and playfulness. Photography, while serious, needn't be somber. All of the traditions of photography are still in play, even as other options emerge with evolving technologies. The speed with which digital materials have met fine art standards has been breathtaking. Photography has always moved, been moved forward by technology. The very first photograph required an eight-hour exposure. Things change, but photography remains a dynamic process that continues in its evolution. At this point in my career, I try to work like a jazz musician, impulsively, with spontaneity, improvising inside of structure and circumstance. I can no longer limit myself to single subjects or themes. That to me has become tyranny. I see pictures every place, all kinds of images that move and excite me. Some are familiar, others uh, come as complete surprises. You reach a point in a life of photography when you recognize your feelings. When something resonates with a familiar timbre that tells you that a picture is present or at least lurking nearby. And when that happens, you have to go for that picture there and then. This is a visceral process that doesn't follow logic. 
Life doesn't come at you in a straight line. There is no reason to expect that pictures will. The lesson that time teaches is that your life finds its own way to make sense. When you see passionately, images abound. Where some see a wall, I see the shadows on the wall. And I find it much more interesting to chase the shadows. I know intuitively that my pictures are connected, but it's not my job to try to figure out how. I'm a photographer. I make pictures. It's my work, and it's my life. And I learned that from Harry Callahan. Thank you. Chip, thank you very much. That was wonderful. You said more eloquently than I ever could uh, in your early remarks um, describing John McWilliams, our next speaker, and his impact, his contribution to the medium of photography, and specifically uh, his contribution to this region, to the South. Uh, this is a man who has um, taught here for many, many years, um, since 1969, he was involved with uh, Georgia State, uh, was the director of, of the School of Art and Design for many years, and still holds the position of Professor Emeritus of Art at GSU. Uh, and during his time there, taught you know, many students who've gone on to have very productive careers. His work is primarily as a photographer, but he's also been very active in more recent years um, with other media of works on paper, woodcuts, drawings, and other kinds of bookmaking processes. And tonight he'll talk about his activity in those different realms. Uh, his photographs are on deposit in major collections in this country, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Fogg Museum at Harvard, the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, and the High Museum. We have at least 40 of John's pictures. and. Uh, they're a very important part of our kind of archive within an archive which represents the photography of, of, of the South, and we're very proud to have those materials in our collection. Uh, John has published numerous periodicals and books over his career, including Land of Deepest Shade, Photographs of the South, as well as Sea Change, the seascape in contemporary photography. Please join me in welcoming John McWilliams. Eleanor, and uh, a lot of old friends, and uh, Chip, uh, thank you so much for your remarks. And, and um, having grown up in Atlanta uh, in terms of uh, as an artist and such, you uh, have been a very valuable part of my life, and I really appreciate it. Uh, we have a, a deep history, along with a number of these other people that are here, too. Um, the, uh, the graduate program in photography uh, at, the, at the Rhode Island School of Design centered on the Sunday night critiques. We were a small group at the time. Uh, it was the beginning of the graduate program in photography, so it hadn't grown uh, to a large size. The critiques uh, were in Harry and Eleanor's home, and it was there that we met Eleanor and Barbara. At the time, Barbara was a teenager, and we would get glimpses of her and her friends. Eleanor was always welcoming. I can remember that Eleanor put out snacks, usually pretzels and horseradish. And um, I had never had this combination before, but believe me, it was addictive. It must be a, a Chicago tradition or something like that, but uh, it went well with beer and, and bourbon. Um, <laughs> Uh, Harry and uh, Eleanor and Barbara had the most enormous cat. Um, this cat was as big as a, a medium-sized dog, uh, and it obviously ruled the household. Um, having just arrived for the critique, we were seated around the living room with our treasured uh, portfolios by our side, and the cat, aloof, would suddenly appear and make a circuit of the room, checking us out and then disappearing. 
The cat occasionally during its inspection of us would pee on the selected portfolio. <laughs> it, was obvious that, it was obvious that the critique had already begun. <laughs> Uh, these critiques were powerful events. Harry's insights were, were simply delivered and sometimes painfully accurate. It would be put simply, that is good or that is dumb. Harry was not a conventional teacher, as, as, as Chips has, has talked about very eloquently. Um, we, knew, we knew that and respected that. What was most important for me was that Harry revealed his process. There was no mystery in the way that he worked, only in what he saw. Harry worked constantly. Photography gave shape and form to his life. The work ethic that he applied to photography gave a structure to his life. One night, or I should say early morning, after we had shown our work and had much discussion, Harry put out a large stack, hundreds of proofs for us to go through. After photographing, Harry would develop and then go through his negatives and make five by, si five by seven proofs of anything that might be of interest. These were quick prints. Uh, the proofs would be put in a growing stack. He would shuffle through the stack and the important pictures would rise to the top. We saw good pictures, dumb pictures as he would call them, and real pearls. What emerged were patterns, a point of view, a direction was revealed. It somehow wasn't just ego that was manifested, but something larger was suggested. There have been artists and photographers who were flashes in the pan, who had brief periods of inspiration and were never able to sustain it, but Harry was not one of them. He sustained his work throughout his life in the greater scheme of things, who can judge which is right? Um, it is the work that's important. But in my own life, I could see that my work could also give shape and structure and form to my life as it had done for Harry. To keep working and exploring was what was important. There would be moments of real inspiration, but I realized that they would not occur if I hadn't worked. As Harry once said when talking about his process, I go out every day, sometimes without an idea of what I'm doing, and sometimes I, and sometimes I would come back without anything. But other times, something would happen. And it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been out looking. Harry's pictures of Eleanor were well known to me early on. The silhouette of Eleanor with her arms raised and enfolded behind her head, the negative areas becoming positive, transforming the figure into an object of imagination, a cat, a demon, an object of fear. At the time, it was amazing to me that Harry could photograph Eleanor, his wife, and the pictures could transcend the subject and suggest something other. Through these, pictures, though, um, <clears throat> through these pictures, I was able to see the potential of contrast, such as showing beauty and its opposite in the same picture. Rarely do you see Eleanor face on. An exception in the picture of Eleanor emerging from the water, she is reflected inward, becomes statuesque. Become, she becomes all women. Another series, Ele uh, another series, Eleanor and Barbara stand in the urban landscapes diminished by their surroundings, but somehow treasured in their miniature. Contrasts, dualities were everywhere. What a rich experience for me to see for the first time. After graduate school, I wandered in my involvement with photography for about three years doing different things. On moving to the South, photography became a means for discovering where I was living. The camera in hand, with the camera in hand, I, it was an excuse or license to explore, to look deeply, and to go places I would not normally go. I was able to give shape and form to where I lived. I had faith in the process from what I had learned from Harry. I loved the yin-yang aspect of photography, 
to be out in the light, confronting subject, and then going into the dark, looking inward, realizing the picture. Photog uh, landscape was the focus, was the center of my focus. I was particularly intrigued with the changing landscape of the South. At the time, in the early 70s, the South's hist history was evident just below the surface. Fifteen minutes outside of Atlanta, you could be in dusty, small southern towns or on a desolate slat pine highway. It was in the, it was in the cusp of change. It was the cusp of, it was the cusp of change in the South. Cities like Atlanta were experiencing unlimited growth potential. And those old slat pine highways were giving way to tentacles of strip development reaching out from the, uh, from the city centers. The earth was being laid bare to reveal prophecies that reflect the aspiration of our society. It was fascinating to be out in it and photographing it. Um, can we dim the lights? And I'd like to show the first slide. <laughs> was sharp. Um, <laughs> Uh, in Alabama, I photographed a tree that was behind a cotton gin and shrouded in industrial waste that referenced the southern motif of the dripping Spanish moss. Iron ironies were everywhere. When I came to photography, its pursuit was unique to other visual media. Its finely tuned silver prints were precious. Its masters were pioneers and few. Photography still needed to affirm its rightful place as a fine art. Now the new technologies have completely democratized it and made it a malleable media, medium beyond belief. It is another tool of many for the visual artists, assimilated into our complex visual language, the precious print and anachronism. The process, whoops, the process of uh, photography had defined my life and was my life for 30 years. But during that time, I would have to step back from it periodically and build something. I needed to work with materials. For a while, it was putting wood together. I built a boat. About 15 years ago, I started drawing again. I was drawing while in art school, as everybody did, uh, in, in freshman foundation and in core classes uh, semester year. I love the immediacy of drawing. It requires a high level of concentration, of being totally in the moment. It seemed to fit my personality. My experiences in photography have influenced my drawing and printmaking. I feel that the dualities and contrasts that were so important in my work photography are equally important in my new work. I do not draw from photographs, but my experience of working observationally in photography are evident in my new work. I love the line, the cut in the wood, and the object. Uh, I would like to show a few slides of my work now, and um, uh, this work uh, comes from where I live. Now, these are woodcuts, and the, some of the problem with projecting like this is that the, the sense of scale is, is really way off. Uh, a lot of these things are very small and are, are, are meant to uh, be seen in, in book form. This is a, a wood engraving here, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's actually quite small. It's maybe about uh, um, three and a half inches by, by two and a half inches.
And I end with the dangerous swan. Um, I treasure my fate that made me part of Harry and Eleanor's life. To have lived with their influence and to have grown organically is a wonderful mystery to me. Even though Harry loved photography, I do not believe that he would disapprove of my moving on to other things. I believe Harry would ask if I was working, if I was looking, and if so, that would be what mattered. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was wonderful. We're going to open it up to some Q&A, so if anybody has uh, specific questions, we'd love to hear from you. Um, perhaps I could begin by um, asking you, John, can you just clarify in that wonderful sequence of slides that you showed um, whether the, you know, there were some great pairings there, whether the works were created um, close together in terms of time or in many years far apart. Can you just explain the relationships a little, a little bit for well, us? The, so the photographs, um, a, a lot of the photographs were fairly, uh, fairly recent within the last um, maybe five or six years. You know? um, <coughs> but the woodcuts and drawings are pretty, um, are quite recent. Um, and a lot of them, <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, some of them are are um, are actually series of um, that are um, in you know that are in book form, and um, and I'm interested in making unique books and such. And uh, and there there's one series particularly like with the peacock uh, uh, and the dead peacock and the vulture and the in the, in the pigs running through the woods and stuff are all um, part of a uh, book that I'm doing on Asobal and deal with the, uh, the, the really um, poignant aspect of, 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 of nature, of life and death that uh, is so prevalent in uh, particularly in the low country. Yeah. You had mentioned that the, uh, the, the woodcuts and so forth weren't based, you didn't use photographs as a sort of references for that work and yet there's a lot of uh, commonality between the imagery. Can you sort of yeah. explain that a bit more? Yeah, I I uh, I, I, I go out and I, I uh, now and I, I do a lot of, a lot of observational uh, work, but I, I draw and, and sketch, and then I will with the woodcuts. I'll, t I'll come back and I'll uh, work on an idea that will be um, you know from something I've seen and such. So uh, oh, I didn't see the peacock with the vulture on it, you know. I, you know, but it's 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 great to take artistic license, so you know, and uh, make your own interpretation of reality. <laughs> and um, one question, actually, for both of you, although it came up in in your um, presentation, John, um, the the pancake stack of of proof prints, you know, the yeah, critiques. Uh -huh, um, yeah. Can you both comment on uh, the you know what you learned um, from from Callahan? about the, the process of editing your own work and how that's sort of been implemented for the rest of your careers in, uh -huh. in various media. Yeah, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the process usually involves spending a lot of time in the dark room trying, doing variance with any given negative that you thought was meaningful at some level. And uh, the way that I did it, personally was I, I would print the negative every way that I, every, every permutation that I could find, uh, varying contrast, burning and dodging, uh, if I could get 15 or 20 versions of a picture. Uh, and then I would spend all night with them. I would take them back to my apartment and lay them out on a table, and I would just shuffle them like, a, like you're play, one would play solitaire. And uh, the, the image was the same, but the interpretation of the image was different. And what I was trying to do was to sensitize myself to some emotional quotient uh, and develop uh, what I've come to refer to uh, is uh, the sense of the resonance of an image, which is the, the emotional resonance of an image is so inter 
uh, interwoven with the, uh, the interpretation of the picture. Uh, so editing first starts at that level. And uh, if, if none of them worked at that level, then you just sort of you'd get rid of them all. I mean, it had, it had to all come together. Uh, and I thought that that was really critical. And, and uh, Harry was, would encourage you to do that. I mean, there was, it was not a hurry to get to the perfect picture. It's like you had to find the picture that made sense for what you envisioned. And typically, uh, you know, the conclusion of a process like that, would you sh share with him in a critique environment one or several of the vari variant interpretations? Well, he, um, you, you would uh, to some degree, but, you know, I think it was important that you made the decisions, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, but, you know, how, what, what photographs you would put with each other were very important, you know, I think. And uh, um, I think the, the, when you're going out and photographing, photography is, is beautiful in this respect that you can take as many pictures as you want of something and from many different angles and work very intuitively. And then when you, uh, when you finally get into the editing process, you are bringing some of the, um, you know, the, the, the issues that you learned in previous uh, experiences and, and, and then also recognizing the patterns that are starting to emerge in your work and, and you build upon those. And that's what Harry would encourage you to do. The, the proof sheets were critical. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Harry used to print every negative. I could neither afford, I, I wasn't patient enough to do that, uh, but I would make proof sheets of everything. And, and th that became my reading material. And I would go back and forth and back and forth. And eventually, uh, and I, I to this day still have a very good memory for specific images that I may have made 35 years ago. Uh, and I will find a, another picture that will connect back directly to it. It's like hearing a piece of music, you know, that takes you right back to a specific place. Well, I, I to this day can make photographs that bring me right back to a, to a picture, of a progenitor, if you will, of, of that particular sort of combined experience. Uh, and it, as, I, as I stated, it was about paying attention to the work that you did. It wasn't, there was no finished product. It was an ongoing open-ended process. I mean, the, there were, you had a, a couple of hours to enjoy a good one, <laughs> and then you were back on the street or wherever it was that you did the work. You know, it was, uh, uh, we weren't there to be satisfied by the work. We were there to continue the work. Hearing you say that reminds me very much of, of comments that Ellen has made in conversation with me during the preparation of the exhibition, also from um, some reading I've, I've done of you know, Harry's own statements about his work, where it was always about you know, sort of hitting the pavement and, and creating more work to go deeper into what you've already explored and you know, to become more, more complex and layered as an artist. Uh, any questions from the floor? <laughs> <We're>, uh, <laughs> they're, they're all they're out there everywhere. <laughs> See, um, John's been I, seeing spiders for a long time. <laughs> no, it's just um, you know I just think. You know, animal motifs are so interesting, and the spider is such a, a powerful motif. And you know, it's it's threatening in some respects, but then it's a, it, it's such a beautiful creature. You know, with its multi legs and and the way it moves and the web it's, it uh, it spins and such. You know. And you know, I I, I I really like the idea of uh, of dualities. And uh, that uh, um, the natural environment can be, be very powerful, but also and very beautiful. But it can be threatening, also. And uh, so that, that's a reoccurring theme in my work. So. You just wait for the microphone. Do you mind, um, so that we can everyone can hear the question? Thank you. Uh, Chip, do you feel as if you're, uh, after 
preparing for this and going back and looking at how many years of, of work and choosing ones that you wanted to share with us, do you feel as if your best work is behind you or is the best yet to come? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, think, I think work as good as I've done is still ahead of me. I, I'm very, I feel very strongly about the work that I've done at, at this stage. Uh, of, of my life. One of the things that's come with the aging process is, and it took a long time, uh, was a sense of confidence in the strength of my vision, which I believe in. And uh, I can't say that in all sectors of my life, but in this particular one, uh, uh, I'm particularly in the process of, of retrospection, because, you know, as I told you, Bobby Julian gave us way too long to think about this thing tonight, so I've spent the uh, obs I've been obsessing for the last five months and uh, going back and digging deeper and uh, a lot of the, the pairings of the pictures that I made I had never thought about prior to two days ago. You know, you just start looking through them and you start seeing relationships. It's like the pictures, with the, with the three pictures that had umbrellas in them, if you, if you notice that. I mean, I, I had never noticed that before. But again, the technology that, we, that, that I'm availing myself to uh, allows me to uh, reconstruct my own history. A number of the black and white images, the one of the, the boys by the river, it was made up of, from three separate photographs, individual negatives. Uh, and uh, so I'm reinventing my history in, in a lot of ways. So in addition, in the process, I'm learning about what I've done and, and what my vision is. So I, I, I'm very hopeful at this point, you know, knock on wood, that my eyes stay strong, uh, and uh, I don't have to keep getting the latest version of Windows or whatever the hell else is going to sort of <laughs> lying out there and wait to sort of end it all for me. Uh, uh, but I, I think that anything, anything that I've done that's good has, has stuff that's good waiting for it, just so it'll look different. Just yeah, as I'd like to add something about that. You know, I, think, I think Harry might have said this, that uh, you're only as good as your next picture. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it sounds like something Harry would say, but yeah. I, I can remember that we used to, that used to be our, our mantra, you know. It does, it does get scary when you think you're not, you're not going to find it. I mean... Uh, what about the, I think, the other thing about your work or your life as a photographer, which I've been struck by, Chip, is the fact that you have a very active relationship to your archive in the sense that you now, you know, you're, you're scanning a lot of your older negatives and you have them available to you on your desktop and it's a sort of constant daily voyage back into your own past and so you're probably rediscovering a lot of pictures that you haven't paid attention to for a long while. Yeah, I've, I've, for, for most of my career I've only cared about generating images. I mean, the, the, the part about exhibition and, and all the sort of external part of it, uh, I've never been particularly uh, fond of, because I'm, I'm pretty insecure when it comes to that particular arena. And uh, although I think we're at a time when a lot of the kinds of pictures that, I, that I've made for years are now con considered uh, artworks. You know, when I was photographing strangers on the street, nobody would buy them. Uh, and. Uh, but that's what I do. That's what I continue to do. And now I see that there are people that have taken notice of those kinds of things. But that, you know, it's neither here nor there. It's just uh, uh, I've noticed that some of the kind of work that I do is sort of migrated, percolated up into more of a mainstream uh, consciousness, perhaps. Right. Just down here, or just from the back there. Yeah, I think we'll come to you. I'd like to ask a variation on the last question, uh, John talked several times about the precious print with a certain sense of nostalgia. Is, are, are, are the best days of photography behind it? No, I, I, I think, um, and I just think that at, at, at the particular time, I think when, uh, when Harry was working and, uh, and I said, as I said, that, the, that there were a few masters and, um, um, you know, photography was was very much concerned about um, establishing itself uh, as a as a viable fine art, and uh, 
um, I just think that that you know that's changed now. I think uh, it's become uh, a much more um, valuable medium that uh, artists can pick up and use and, and uh, change and manipulate. I think um, I think the younger generation is going to give it shape and form like we can't even imagine. Um, so. I think it's 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 kind of exciting. I think everything changes. Everything's got a life. I think the precious print uh, and the and 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 the uniqueness of photography uh, is a thing of the past. Uh, I, I just well, the the cult of the precious print, which which is uh, which has been generated by the marketplace number one and by acolytes of people like Ansel Adams and John Sexton. Uh, who place an emphasis on methodology uh, in order to make what I consider oftentimes to be pretty hollow images uh, as, a, as compared to a person like Callahan who, who was the opposite. I mean, he printed on Kodak Metalist or whatever was available, a fairly standard D76 developer uh, or a Dectol rather uh, developed print. And uh, he seemed to get uh, uh, invest a huge amount of emotional potency into his pictures. Uh, and w with with relative ease, and uh, uh, the the cult of the print and the collectible print as a rarefied object is antithetical to photography's uh, inherent nature, which is to be photography was never in, intended to be difficult to do. Uh, uh, it was supposed to be a democratic, accessible process, and even uh, to finesse it and to nuance it and to use all all the sort of subtle words that we can to, to describe the, uh, the more subtle distinctions of tonality and texture and all the various things. Uh, it's really not that hard to do. I mean, a lot of people make very good prints, but their pictures really stink. And uh, that's the truth. Uh, and there are a lot of people, some people certainly, who really struggle with printmaking, but somehow manage to make a photograph that knocks your eyes out, mm. even though it might not be, conform to uh, the perfect, uh, you know, perfectly executed print by some standards, and there are whole workshops and industries now uh, dedicated to that. And there's a gallery industry uh, that likes to sell pictures on the basis of their rarity. And if, you know, there are 600 existing prints of Moonrise, Moonrise Hernandez. I mean, there's nothing rare about that number, uh, and they can still get a hundred thousand bucks if you can find one sitting around somewhere. But I think that. Uh, if the way that you measure silver-based materials, if that's what you're talking about, Ben, I mean, for the most part. I mean, palladium prints and platinum prints and uh, cyanotypes and uh, some of the autochromes that Stieglitz did back in the day, I mean, those are rare objects and they really are coveted, uh, not necessarily because they're beautiful, but they're rare. Um, but the, the industry got the message, and in the last six months alone, there have been five new uh, printing papers available for digital printers that exceed uh, the so-called DMAX of black and white printing papers. These are blacker blacks, brighter whites, uh, archival richness, cotton fiber base, or other kinds of acid-free materials. All the criteria that, that has been used traditionally to gauge the material base of a fine photograph. And you can have an even greater degree of control because you can work on at a pixel level. Uh, you know, you can basically change the color of a person's eyes in a picture now if you wanted to. So any level of control that you want, uh, we never could, would have dreamed of in a, in a darkroom process 30, 40 years ago, uh, any more than autofocus cameras and motor-driven cameras and computer-based cameras or any of those things. But we used to fantasize about it, about making our life easier. It's still about photography. Photography is still about making pictures, not artifacts. Um, actually, this question is for Eleanor, if I may. Um, I know what I'd like to ask. I don't know if I can phrase it in the right way, but I'd like to know what it was like being his wife and his uh, subject and his photographs. You are so beautiful then, and you're absolutely beautiful now. I'm wondering if you can maybe share some of those experiences. Mm. <laughs> Some people haven't heard this before. Oh, <laughs> well, I hear this frequently 
And the thing is, what most people don't understand is I am no model. I've never been a model in my life. Whatever you see in those pictures are the things that Harry wanted. You talk about the arms over my head. Harry told me to do that. <laughs> he wanted a picture with me and I, or uh, different uh, phases. Uh, I, I, I've never been a model. I've just been in love with Harry all my life, and anything he wanted, I did. Uh, what was the other thing you were saying? We were oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. I would be cooking a, a dinner, and Harry would be at the windows, and he would say, "Oh, Eleanor, the light is so wonderful right now." He said, "Could you come and uh, let me take this picture?" And I said, "Well, sure." So I go. I'm in the kitchen. I go and turn off all the heat and put all the pans away so nothing burns and go and there is the picture you would see. It would be me by the windows or something and it's all all of Harry's sort of thing. Uh, another one I can think of at the moment is uh, the one by the radiator. And uh, you see me with uh, my, I think it was my right leg up, you know, one leg and one up against the uh, radiator. That's all Harry's uh, uh, way of wanting the picture to look. Uh, so I, I, and as far as a wife, I don't know how other wives are, but <laughs> Harry and I were very com comfortable and very um, loved with each other and had no problems. But uh, as far as a model, uh, as different people would ask me, I am certainly no model. I'm just a, just a woman that's there for her husband. I'd like to add something. I'd like to add something to that, if I, if I can. When we were very young when, when we met you guys, Eleanor. I mean, you know, we were, I was a teenager. And... Um, Many of, many of the photographs of you had already been reproduced and were well known. Uh, and what it enabled us to, because we used to talk about you, right? We used to talk about you, try to understand uh, who you were and what, what a picture of you meant. And getting to know you, even informally or casually, uh, just sort of confounded the question because uh, we would get to know you as a person. And then we, but we came to understand that photography uh, had the uh, had the ability to to transform things and and uh, enable them to take on a different meaning and a, and a new meaning. I mean, by by virtue of being photographed by Harry, you helped us understand the power of photography because you you became as uh, as John referred to all women, which was uh, you know this kind of universal symbol of women is, is the way we thought Harry uh, saw you as a photographic subject, which helped us to understand how photography worked overall, that it was a transformative process. So we're very indebted to, the, to your close cooperation to Harry for all those years, because you, uh, you helped us learn a whole lot. Well, the, also, the, 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 the things that you uh, would respond to were the things of your, of your immediate life, you know, yeah. the people around you. And, uh, um, that, you know, that you could photograph your friends, your wife, your, uh, your teapot, and, uh, and you could make something of it that would uh, really be powerful and transcending. Oh, Chip, you used that phrase of a private beauty of my own making as being sort of a principle for your own work that you, you know, learned directly from Callahan and obviously the, the Eleanor work within his overall uh, yeah, I mean, that's, opus is a major part of that concept. Well, particularly, I mean, I, I was tr trying to describe where, where I had come out of and which was not, a, not untypical. Uh, I mean, photography was seen either as a commercial process for marketing, you know, soap or pictures of, of products, uh, or as a kind of decorative way of looking at travel experiences. I mean, it was not uh, personal. 
I mean, the thing about Harry was all of a sudden there was this guy who made these pictures that didn't make any sense. Like, why would anybody want to look at that? You know, you had to wrestle with that. And that was a very difficult thing to cope with. But you realize that it, that it meant something to him and that ultimately that was what mattered. And you had to, you know, learn that, that you, you turn that philosophy uh, into your own guiding one and you look you have to develop a sense of confidence that whatever it was that you were looking at, for whatever the reason you were looking at it, you had to trust that it was significant to you. And it almost didn't, it would be nice. Harry used to say, I, I, I like it if my pictures touch people. But it, but it wasn't insistent that they had to. Do we have a couple more questions just to close out um, the evening? Just one or more over here in the middle. Chip, I'm, I'm curious about something. Um, you said earlier that you've like fully immersed yourself into the digital world, right? I mean, do you, do you find that as, as, as you sort of fully immerse yourself in there that the, uh, did I hear you say that you made an image out of three separate images? Yeah. So do you find that the artifacts that you make now, I mean, it's not any different than making a silver print, except you're focused more on each individual image. It's almost like now you can be God, because you can fix anything in an image that's wrong. Okay. I mean, do you, do you find that more liberating? I mean, do you do that? Well, I, I do it on occasion, and, and uh, when it moves me, you know, if I come upon something what it's done is a breakdown of inhibition uh, for me. I mean, I, I think ultimately I still come back to a fairly conventional approach to picture making, but I understand now that uh, nothing is, is uh, everything is protein, everything is malleable, everything I look at is liquid. Uh, uh, it's not fixed on film. It's sort of waiting there to see how I, what, I, what else I want to decide to do with it. So every picture that I showed you tonight uh, has had some significant enhancements, uh, but many of them were not intended to make it look like they were enhanced, like the picture of like the three photographs of the kids at the you know, swimming. Uh, I mean, that was quite deliberate to make it look like that because the it presented itself as a sort of an artistic challenge, an aesthetic challenge, and it worked for me. And, it, and I did that. And there was another photograph, a longer one, uh, that was four unrelated pictures taken in different places. And, but because of the way that I structure my, my aesthetic, they all sort of fit together. Because regardless of the different uh, subjects, I constructed them on the picture plane in a similar fashion, so they, so I was able to see that and then combine those pictures. They still have their in individual integrity, and yet they come together into another form. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but it, in other words, it's all okay for me now. You know, uh, whatever moves me, photography is is a much broader field than, I mean, of course, I mean, you were one of the, the people that started breaking it apart and, and challenging all of that kind of stuff all those years back. Uh, but I think we've all gotten to the point now where we can think more freely along those lines. The situation makes sense to it. One final question over here. I'd like to uh, comment on your comment that now photographers can play God. Uh, painters, I guess, have always played God. I mean, there's not a lot of difference between what photographers can do and what painters do. I mean, there's, you create your concept and uh, I don't see anything any different, really, than has always been true of artists. Well, the difference would be the illusion of that. Well, yeah, of course, photographs have been manipulated since the beginning. Well, on that note, this nice internal discussion, I want to thank uh, John McWilliams and Chip Simone for sharing um, their lives as artists with us tonight, um, their uh, memories and thoughts of Harry and Eleanor Callahan, and I want to thank you all for coming. Thanks so much. Good night.
Thank you.